All right, my mic is on. Good. Just, just, just double checking. <laughs> is the green We're light good. on? We're good. <laughs> okay. Hey, and welcome to today's episode of Open Your Heart Podcast. I'm so excited because today we're talking with Juliana. She is a former foster care social worker, so we get to learn all the ins and outs of the foster care system and the role that she played in it. Well, welcome to today's podcast. I am so excited for this episode. We're going to be talking with Miss Juliana, and she is a former foster care social worker. So we get to learn the ins and outs of the system and the role that she played in it. So you ready to just jump right into it? Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to be here with you today. So my first question for you is, you know, of course, what was your role that you played in the system, but then also what did your job look like on a day-to-day -day basis so can you kind of paint a picture for us of what that looked like um so my job i was at dfax for about a year um and my job kind of shifted throughout my time there i started i was hired as a foster care case manager so that was managing um coordinating collaborating with my cases that had student not students kids that are in the foster care system. So their okay. parents um, no longer had custody. The state had custody custody of them. And um, the they were working a case plan to get their kids back. Okay. Um, about six months in, I got told um, by one of my supervisors that I had the spice that was needed to do family preservation, which is kind of okay. a more hidden side of DFACS that people don't really get to see. I've never heard of that. So can you explain that? I would love to explain <laughs> okay. it. It actually became like a huge passion of mine while I was there. Okay. Um, family Prez is kind of, we refer to it, referred to it as like a gentleman's agreement. Um, so the kids are not bound by court, like in foster care. Okay. Um, Interesting. It's, we see a safety concern and we're putting supports in. We're trying to maintain that family. It's not mm -hmm. so severe that we have to pull them out immediately, okay. but it's not, low enough to where we feel like we can step away entirely yeah. um, and so it's just trying to put supports in and bandage up the family so that they can stay together and that was kind of the latter portion of my time at DFAX. Um, there was to say paint a typical day yeah um, I <laughs> how about the first six months prior to that the first six months so typically across the board there was not really a typical day I'm okay uh, it just really depended. Um, I would set schedules. So you always had a to-do list and I got really good at like having a running to-do list and knowing I was never going to get everything crossed off, which starting at DFAX, that was so frustrating. Like I would get so mad at myself. Like, why didn't I get everything done? Um, but then you just learn like there's always going to be something that these families need. Yeah. And when you care about it and your heart's in it, it's never going to be done. And, and you've got to be okay with, I did what mm, I could for today mm, and I've got to yeah. go be a person somewhere else now. Um, okay. Yeah. So good. a typical day um, could look like um, I would try to schedule visits for um, Monday to Thursday. So that's going into the homes. So you're seeing the parents, you're going to see the kids, you're um, making sure kids are safe in their foster placements. You're making sure that foster parents have what they need. And they're supplying what the kids need. Mm -hmm. And then with parent visits, it's you have the case plan with you and you're like, have you done this yet? Have you done this yet? Mm -hmm. um, and those things are like parenting classes. And um, if it's a drug related case, then have you gone to drug counseling? Are you in drug court? What are you doing to mm -hmm. um, not fix, but like work on these concerns that we saw in the home yeah, yeah. um so you're so you're visiting both the foster homes and the foster kids and then also the biological parents yes of the foster kids yes all okay. of the above we're seeing everybody okay. because as the caseworker your goal is to coordinate all their services so okay if the foster kids need counseling you're making sure they have a counselor if the parents need counseling you're making sure they have a counselor uh, and then you're okay. making sure like parents are going to counseling mm -hmm. foster kids are getting to their appointments mm -hmm. and ensuring that everybody's putting in the work to create a healthier family because um i think one of the first things they tell you in training is that defax's goal in georgia is creating stronger families and so it seems like with foster care you're ripping the family unit apart mm. but it's really 
it's similar to like when you have a kid in crisis, like they're yeah. mad about something. If you pull them out of that environment for a minute, yeah. even in a school setting, you pull them out of the classroom and let them walk somewhere else for a minute, mm -hmm. then they can settle back down. And that's kind of what it sure. is. You're pulling them out of the crisis mode that they've been in. Mm -hmm. um, and there's gnashing of teeth and fighting, all of that. Yeah. Um, but then they can breathe a little bit and get the help they need if they can shift their mindset a little bit and look at it in that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lots of visits, um, lots of, you have to document everything you do. So any um, visits that you do, any coordinating of services that you do, you're documenting that into the documentation portal. Wow. Okay. So a lot of paperwork. So much paperwork. That was what my Fridays typically were. I tried to be at my desk typing everything in because it was my okay. impossible task. I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just, you know, typing away and trying yeah. to get pages and pages of notes yeah. that I'd written typed up. Um, so Monday through Thursday, you were typically out mm -hmm. visiting. And then Fridays, you were doing the paperwork. I was, I was hopefully in trying. my office. Unless <laughs> yeah. like sometimes parents weren't where they needed to be for the visit mm -hmm. that fall through. Yeah. Foster parents have things come up. And so you're doing makeup visits as well because you have to see every single person on your case every single month. Um, and then okay. there's also like court dates that pop up as well that we are required to be at to Okay, so we're you, we're representing the department side in court, so to speak. Okay, so you have to be at the those court visits, yes, as well. There is a lot that you guys do. It sounds like it's like you carry. It's genuinely like if you don't want to have the same like eight eight to five or nine to five job where you're doing the same exact thing every mm -hmm. single second of every day, this is the job for you because <laughs> yeah. literally, like, I could not tell you what I was going to be doing each and every day yeah. because it was just so up in the air. And like some days yeah. I was in North Georgia all day. And then some days I was like in Columbus and Augusta wow. driving to go see foster kids because they can be placed anywhere in the state of Georgia. Okay. So when a case would come in, it could be from anywhere. Um, so for or... our, so I was region two in Banks and Stevens County. Okay. Um, and we would get, so their central intake and they get all of the reports that come in mm -hmm. and they label them with immediate 72, 24, like just response time, 72 yeah. hours, 24 hours, yeah. depending on how se severe it is. But we would only get the ones that um, were from our area. So if okay. the parents address was in Banks or Stevens County, mm -hmm. that's when we would have to respond to it. And that's when they would become our kids. Okay. Um, and there's like, you hear talk about land wars and defects and that's mm. where um like the the address is like on the line of a county and so we at one point had so many kids coming in that we were really strict about like this address is in hall county or it yeah. is in this other county habersham yeah. county so mm. we're not picking that up because that's not then you would be even more role. overloaded right correct yeah correct okay and so, so we had to get one. really specific yeah. about like where the kids were from so that they could be serviced by a caseworker in their own county. In their own county. That makes sense. Now, how many cases would you say that you handled at a time? <laughs> um, so I don't remember the exact number of like cases, mm -hmm. but I think at one point there were 42 kids on my load. Wow. Okay. Yes. Now, would, was that um, like sibling groups as well? Yes. So, of, okay. so I, I think the biggest sibling group I had was about six kids. Okay, um, and wow. but luckily they were all in one placement, which was really nice. Oh, but you have some sibling groups yeah. where, um, like older siblings, maybe they've seen more, they've experienced more trauma, yeah. and so they need higher levels of care than you know the baby that didn't really understand what was going on. Yeah. So then they may be in separate homes, because right? Of that. Okay. And so that causes you know with the monthly visits, um, I'm trying to see eye to eye, looking them in the face, making yeah. sure they're safe. Yeah. Um, and instead of being able to just go one stop shop, I'm going to this place and to this county and to this house over here. And so yeah. one case could require six or seven visits. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. So a lot of driving too. So much driving. My, driving. so when I started, I was driving a Camry and it got hit in a Mexican restaurant parking lot. It's oh, no. really tragic. Gladys was ruined. That um, was her name. Her name was Gladys. She was a crotchety <laughs> old woman. That car was. <laughs> Um, That's hilarious. <laughs> and so I got a Subaru and when I bought mm. the Subaru, it had about 80,000 miles on it. Mm. When I left the department 
I was over like 120,000 miles, wow. just all the hither and tither and driving everywhere. Wow. And that was within just that one year. Just that one year because it was like year. a month in my car got totaled yeah. and I had to buy a new car. Oh. Yeah, it was it was good, good life changes there. <laughs> you probably needed it, right? Oh, you definitely. It, so. Definitely. Especially I didn't know at the time the amount of driving I was going to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, it was definitely like you know, a God thing. Like he was like, yeah, you're going to yeah. need a new car. This is, yeah. this is just yeah. let it happen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. It, wor it worked out. It, it worked it. out in the end. I love it. Perfect. Okay. Um, all all right. right. So my next question for you is why do you think the foster care system gets such a bad rep? Like I hear it a lot and that, oh, the system is so broken. And so like, what do you have to say about that? It is a broken system. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I don't think there is a way to go into a family dynamic because each family has its own culture even in what we would call a normal or good family like my family mm -hmm. does things differently than your family right, and right so it's hard to go in and be able to more or less judge the situation without it coming off as rude or wrong in our mm -hmm. culture yeah. um but even going back to that mindset shift that parents need to have where we're just getting them out of the situation so everyone can breathe. Yeah. Um, it's not seen like that. We're it's for lack of a better word, it's ripping families apart at yeah. at the heart of it because yeah. that's what has to happen right. for there to be space to put in supports. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the really severe cases. Yeah. Um, and so I think that really plays into it. You the loudest voices that you hear usually are the ones that have had kids taken out of the home. Mm -hmm. Um because they're angry and they're mad sure. and they're hurt. Sure. And even if they've done something wrong, even if there was textbook, black and white, good reasons why the kids were removed, mm -hmm. it's still hard. And, right. sure. and the kids, it's hard on the kids. They don't yeah. understand it either. And so right. they're sometimes loud about it depending on their access to social media. Um, mm. So that's another voice in the, in the game. And their, yeah. their voices are valid. For sure. Um, yeah. They're the ones literally walking through this nightmare. Right. right. Um, and then you, to add on top of all of that, like case management is a, for lack of a better word, low level position. It's entry level. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I have a psych undergrad mm -hmm. um, with a master's in school counseling. So before I got my master's, case management was really the only thing I could do. Psychology does not open up to a world of great career opportunities okay. on its own. Mm -hmm. um, and so luckily, like I have a heart and a passion for helping people. And so yeah. like, and I, I love the mystery of like solving all these moving pieces to my cases. Mm. So I was able to put my heart into it. Yeah. But there's some people it's a paycheck and it's, this is what I have to do to put food on my table at yeah. home. And those cases, not that they suffer and not that they don't get the services that they need, mm -hmm. but they also you can tell when someone's just doing a job to do a job yeah. versus yeah. when it's something that they care about. Yeah. And I think that bleeds over into people's opinions mm. of the department. That may, yeah, that's, that's a great point that, you know, because maybe, maybe it's not necessarily the system itself, but the people that are in the mm -hmm. system, right. And kind of their, their feelings about the system right yes. and their heart about the system yes and for you you your heart was there yes and so because of it's that, the difference between somebody that cares and a warm body doing the job mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. it's not yeah. social work sadly can't be some not sadly it shouldn't be something that's like working at mcdonald's or right chick-fil-a and those jobs are important and i'm so grateful for my chick-fil-a and mcdonald's employees because <laughs> that's right Amen. i love my jesus chicken um but these are people's lives people's that we're lives. talking about and right. people's childhoods and right. their entire world is impacted when yeah. I, when I stepped through the door, I knew that their world was changing. Right. Especially like mm. on call days when I had to play investigator, yeah. like their world was shifting. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just a lot deeper than showing up and checking off a list and going home. Right, right. Because you are now involving yourself in these families. Yes. I mean, and so, I mean, I could, I could only imagine, like, if a social worker stepped in my house, like, how I would mm -hmm. feel, right? It's probably scary for them. Yes, and right? that was the mindset I tried to enter every visit with because it, even though I don't have 
kids of my own and that mm-hmm. I knew could be a very sore topic if yeah. they ever asked. So I tried not to give too much of that information away sure. because I didn't want them thinking, well, what do you know? You know, right. that's right. just the whole thing in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but putting myself in the position of if somebody just walked into my house and started telling me I was doing everything wrong, how would I respond? Right. And how would right. I want that message to be relayed so that yeah. I could respond? I could give it in the best way possible to the people I was sure. more or less impacting. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great So point. did you get a lot of information right away um, with the, with the cases that you would receive? Like, did you get a lot of information about the, ch- the children or did that take time for you to get in order to pass that information along to the foster parents? Yes. And the documentation system, if it's a case that's just being transferred from like, like one county to another or from one case manager to another, Mm -hmm. um, then you have history in the portal and you can go back and read all of the information about different visits with the parents, with the kids, what's going on. If it's in the same office, you can go and be like, what's this kid like in visits? What's going on with this kid? Um, If it's a brand new case straight from investigations, a lot of times, sadly, it's a cycle there is history from previous mm-hmm. investigations and there's okay. typically several investigations that happen before a case is called foster care. Okay. Um, so you can go and read all of that. My personal take on it was I could read everything under the sun about a kid, but mm-hmm. you don't know a child until you're looking them face to face and you're mm-hmm. spending time with them. Yeah. Um, and so I got in um, not trouble, but like, a little corrected, like I was spending too much time at my visits. I would, I was the one that was like, you know, they wanted visits to be like maybe 20 minutes max. Mm-hmm. I was there hour, hour and a half because I wanted to know my kids. I wanted to know their right. needs and I wanted sure. to know what they wanted out of things. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to be the one to know, like, I wanted to know my cases. Yeah. I wanted to be able to coordinate sure. well for them. Yeah. Um. Because so you cared. So yes, and you have the information. You can read about them. You can put in that work that way, which I did. Mm-hmm. It was a requirement. But also, you have to take time to get to know the, the kids. And you have to get, take time to get to know them and what they're like and what their family situation is yeah. like to be able to give a fuller picture. Um, and a lot of times you're getting cases as a foster care case manager where they're already placed in foster homes. And they've already gotten to that point. You're just kind of stepping in halfway through a story yeah okay and just kind of hit the ground running every time really truly it's like even there was one time i got a case on a monday and court for that case was the next day Mm. and i had to show up ready to go yeah for court which luckily the other caseworker was in our office and so she went with me and she was able to help me out with the knowledge piece of it but like being able to just hit the ground running ready to go with a new case was kind of vital and each situation yeah so did you ever get a case where you didn't have in, any information like that in the system it, it was an investigation um mm-hmm. i was on call over the weekend and mm-hmm. we got an investigation in and there wasn't really much of anything in our system mm-hmm. about the parents about the kids about anything and so i kind of was just flying blind going into this investigation situation yeah. yeah um and it turned into getting like we had to pick up kids we had to like do all the. it was one of the worst investigations i've done like Mm. it went immediately from investigation to foster care pretty quickly like within two days yeah um because we tried to safety play and we tried to create a site a space where the kids could remain with in the home without um custody having to be transferred yeah and that just wasn't possible Mm -hmm. um but it was very interesting like having to be the one like their introduction to the system mm-hmm. like it was very different than coming in as like they've had caseworkers coming in and yeah. out already they kind of know the drill yeah like these people didn't know anything they yeah. were um very new to the system and it was very overextending of myself because the family members that wanted to help the kids expected me to be available all the time every day every hour Um, and then the parents were like ready to hunt me down because they didn't, they didn't understand why or what or anything Mm -hmm. about what was going on. Yeah. Wow. That's tough. Yeah. Yeah. It it was, it was interesting. That situation was. That would be really hard. Now, did you ever witness a child having to sleep in a defects office? Sadly, yes. Um, 
we luckily at Banks and Stevens County, we didn't see that often. Mm -hmm. Um, It usually happens with kids that have the more severe behaviors. They are definitely ones that have seen more of life than they should have by the time that we get to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if their behaviors are really through the roof, it's hard to find placement. Sure, and then it's sense. hard to find. We have companies and organizations that hotel the kids um, mm-hmm. if there's not a foster family ready. And so okay. they can go and they have a supervisor that stays in the hotel with and them. The, okay. Um, but even if their behaviors are to a certain degree, then that's not even safe. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one girl in particular who um, I think she stayed over a weekend at the office and the case managers we just all like rotated Rotated, in and out to make sure that everyone was covered and not one person was staying there for all hours on end because you go crazy. Right. Um, And you need to sleep. And you need to sleep. And you don't feel like you can do that when there's a child there who's been, you know, in the situation that they're in. Yeah. Um, So yes, sadly I have experienced Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, And it's, I mean, there's a lot of factors that play into why that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but luckily our office had like a visitation room that had a pull out couch in it. And so like there was, a, there was a setup at least that they weren't just like sleeping on a carpet yeah, and un- yeah. under someone's desk. Yeah. Like there was places for them to lay that were a little more mm-hmm. cozy than an office chair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good that you, ha- you had that already set up because yes. you know that it's a possibility. It, it like is. it definitely can happen and it does. And it clearly does happen. Yes. So, um so okay so my question for you is and we might have touched on this a little bit earlier why why did you decide to become a social worker and i know you did it for about a year but but why did why was it something that interested you i graduated with my undergrad in psych in 2019 Mm -hmm. and um i didn't know what i was going to do like Mm -hmm. i had no idea what do you do with a psych degree not much yeah. Um, so I actually ended up working with a group home in Carrollton, Georgia for about a year before they closed down due to COVID. Oh, wow. Um, okay. and that was like my first introduction to foster care was the group home world, which is not, it gets a reputation of just kids with the bad behaviors go to the group homes. Sometimes that's the only placement that's available. Mm-hmm. So those are for foster kids. The, those group foster homes. kids okay. are, um, the group homes I worked in are for kids that are in foster care. So their custody is with the state. Um, Then I moved to Florida and I worked in another group home for about a year. Mm -hmm. Um, And that group home, it, it just wasn't the greatest position for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't love some things about it. Loved the kids 110% all of the time, but Mm -hmm. there were just some administratorial things that were like, eh, I don't know if I like this vibe. Um, So I started thinking like what do I what would I do if I wasn't doing group homework because the schedule was not great Mm -hmm. the it was it was a lot of um, secondary trauma being passed on Mm -hmm. to me Um, and so that's when I started considering like defects case management and that Mm -hmm. side of social work Mm -hmm. and thinking like if I could see both sides to this story because I was only seeing the kids at this point if I could see the parents and what they're going through and like the houses they're walking in yeah maybe I'd get a fuller picture. Maybe I'd be able to understand more where they're coming from. And so that's when I started pursuing um, social work positions. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually, um, because I was in Florida and I was trying to move back to Georgia, I um, played what I called um, surprise resume, where I would just drop my resume off at different (laughs) locations, like the county surrounding where I was going to be living. Um, And Banks and Stevens County was just the first county to contact me um, and offer me a position. And that's how I ended up there. Um, and it ended up being like, I made some really great friends who were really great supports. Yeah. Um, and just getting to see the full picture really was, um, was it eye opening for you? Eye opening, helpful. I currently working as a school counselor, like I can now, like when teachers come to me with concerns about student safety and I just have a much fuller picture of like yeah. what might be going on and yeah I don't have to spring to like red flags all of a sudden like yeah I can I can keep a level head in those more crisis yeah. type situations because yeah. I've seen the group home side of things where things are literally threatening lives at some point yeah. I've seen the defect side of things where you're juggling 
110 things at one time and also trying to encourage and beg parents to complete a case plan so they can have their kids back. Um, So I can, I can better relate on this side of things Mm -hmm. of like, yes, I see your concerns with your student. Um, But also have we talked to the parents? Have we coordinated with the parents? Have Mm -hmm. we even attempted any sort of relationship there? Um, Because I was one, I still sometimes am one that was afraid of the parents Mm -hmm. and like those visits were scary at the beginning Mm -hmm. but on this side of things i'm like it's important to let them be the parent even if i know better if i feel like i know better about a situation Mm -hmm. they're still mom and dad right and they still deserve a say in their student or their child's life right right yeah that is important you're right and that's so cool how you you know you started in the group homes and then you went to dfax and now you're a counselor and so Mm -hmm. i mean just to the point where you got now you're able to take what you learned from that into what you're doing now mm-hmm. and and that's so cool because it's like you've seen so many different sides yeah and 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 you and now and now look where you are you know what i mean and, like and it's not so, to say like counseling is so much higher or better no, than a group no. home employee mm-hmm. but it's a it's good background for me because I I knew my end goal was school counseling yeah um that's really why I got a psychology degree to begin with is I wanted to be in the school system doing what I'm doing today yeah but I think maybe you had to go through those things I'm grateful for the experience yeah there were some days where you know I've driven home crying because of the things Mm. I've seen and the things that my kids were experiencing but yeah um at the end of the day I'm grateful for those experiences because I think it softened my heart a lot to the things that I get to see now sure. um, and the the arena that I'm working in now is very different, obviously, than yeah. a group home or DFAX, but it's allowed me a fuller perspective mm-hmm. um, yeah. for sure. That's awesome. Now, is it something that you would ever consider going back to? That is or a not? loaded question. <laughs> I, um, oh, I love this question because it's such a hard thing for me to answer. Mm-hmm. I loved my time both at the group homes and at DFAX. Yeah. I loved my time while I was there. Yeah. Um, looking back, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I can more clearly see the good and the bad of both. Sure. Because, sure. you know, when you're, when, you know, school counseling, it's really hard. It's easy to see everything at DFAX in rose colored lenses where it's like, everything was so great there. Why am I not still there? Mm-hmm. Um, But I think for right now, I have such a peace about where I'm at Mm -hmm. that I I wouldn't say I would never go back because I definitely give God all the opportunity to like up turn my plans upside down. That's right. That's right. It's all in his hands. It's all in his hands. And and you never know what he's going to what he's going to ask. You never know. (laughs) But for right now, I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. Sure. Um, And there's also like the more practical not practical but you know just the more life side of things where it's like i'm engaged now and my oh, fiance congratulations. <laughs> um my fiance he's Yay. not very keen on like there's some there's some safety concerns when you're mm. a female going into these houses sure. and doing these visits and yes i can call law enforcement to go with me um but that's you're not supposed to do that every time yeah. and okay. there's some places where you're going into and it's genuinely a safety concern and it's genuinely scary yeah um and he's not comfortable with me doing that and i out of respect for him and out of love for him don't want him sitting at his day job all day every day worrying about what situations i'm walking into and what i'm dealing with right um so we would he would have to do some serious soul searching and god would probably have to like come face to face with him and say, yeah. this is what she's doing now yeah. for that yeah. to be something he feels at peace with. Yeah. yeah. No, that, yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. And it's just, you know, the season of life that you're mm-hmm. in now. And, yeah. and so, um, well, thank you so much for sharing everything and, and, you know, I just really appreciate it. And it's good to get your perspective on it too. And hopefully people will, you know, really learn from this to see this, the, the true side of a social worker in the foster care system. Cause it takes a lot God bless you guys. <laughs> um, I'm so thankful for you guys because because you guys carry a heavy burden. So, yes. So thank you for the work that you've done in the community well, you. and, you know, to help maintain families. Thank and that's you. really what you guys are there for. All right. 
Thank you guys so much for tuning in to episode one of Open Your Heart Podcast. I really, really hope you got a good picture of the role that a social worker plays in the child welfare system. As you can see, there is a lot that they do. And so I hope this taught you guys a lot because it certainly taught me a lot about the role that they play. So you guys stay tuned for episode two. You're not going to want to miss it.